What's up, guys? I'm Dev34. Welcome to Dev Talk 6, where Lord Farquaad and I will be talking about Fallen Civilization, our Just Cause 2 multiplayer mod server. Hey there, everyone. There's a lot of good stuff in this video, and even an exciting announcement at the end, so be sure to stick around. So I guess the first thing we'll talk about, uh, just the very beginning. It all started uh, with me and my desire to make a survival server. I knew it would be a huge task, so immediately I sought help in the form of a partner. Uh, first person I found was able to host a server for me, but uh, as development slowed to halt, I decided to abandon the project for a few weeks, and then I'd continue it alone uh, once I felt the motivation. So uh, one day I was just scanning the Just Cause 2 multiplayer mod forums, and I stumbled across a post from Lord Farquaad. And so I sent him a message, um, and I was asking what he had accomplished, if he had any future plans. And after that, I sent him some scripts, I got into contact with him, and um, we loaded those up on his server, and he seemed pretty interested after trying them out. So uh, pretty soon after that, we came to a decision to keep working together on the project. And I guess it's important to note that uh, when I met Farquaad, I really only started on basic development on a um, inventory system and save zones, so they looked pretty horrible. Alright, yeah, so here are the classic three loot boxes. Yeah, so this is where it all started. I think months of development happened with these. So yeah, they're using just the, the classic uh, Gwen menu. <laughs> it looks horrible, I mean, let's be honest. Uh, so yeah, now the work began. Uh, once we kind of made that decision, we organized our ideas in a Google Docs file, and we began chipping away at the ideas slowly. Uh, my obsession became the loot inventory storage system. Um, that's something that I've worked on and just refactored over and over, and that for many months. At the same time, Lord Farquaad started to work on other scripts to create a balanced experience for the server. Uh, okay, so to get more in depth with the loot inventory storage system, um, it was something that, as I talked about, it's changed a lot throughout development. It started out uh, with just a simple Gwen menu, had tallies for every item that you could find. I did it that way because I really wasn't skilled enough to make anything better. Uh, later on, the idea of categories and tiers of loot became part of our plan. And we had, uh, once again, a Gwen-based uh, user interface that was divided into loot categories. That's always been the fundamental idea behind that system, uh, having categories and tiers. Um, but what's in place today looks a lot different. Uh, so through beta and also release, we changed the inventory system to have icons for every item. So the system with the icons looked really nice, but it wasn't sustainable. Uh, a lot of people were complaining about the frame drops when they were leaving their inventory open. Uh, so soon after release, we ended up with a more lightweight system without the icons. Um, so that's still in place today. Uh, storages didn't change much from when I first got them done. Uh, the plan was to add a lot of different storage types. Um, you know, locked storages, just uh, you know, more space, having that all kind of split up into different tiers of storages. But the idea of different storage types that got put behind durability, um, and durability never really got done in the first place, so it never happened. One of the biggest struggles in the beginning uh, was trying to figure out how to move data effectively from client to server and server to client. I didn't know a lot about the etiquette uh, surrounding this, and I ended up creating a client authoritative system, which, although it didn't really pose any uh, real security issues looking back on it now, uh, that's something I regret because it's just inferior and is less safe. So one of the first uh, scripts that I started working on for the server was the IP menu. And I had a lot of different ideas for the survival server, but after looking at the doc, I did decide to work on the IP menu, and it was based off of the one that you can find in Anarchy Online. So the IP menu is a menu where you can spend your IP to increase different skills for your player that you can specialize in different things, such as crafting, or running, or killing people, and stuff like that. And you get more IP when you level up. Unfortunately, I didn't achieve my goal for the IP menu, and it was a complete mess. It was a mess not only because it was the first script I worked on for Fallen Civilization, but also because most of the skills you could raise were useless. Crafting proficiency was literally the only thing people wanted, because it actually allowed you to craft better items, and everything else on there didn't really matter. About half the IP menu had stamina-related entries, and all of those were useless. Some of them have cool things, but none of them were really great. So one of the first modules I worked on was Friends. Um, from the very beginning, we wanted people to play the server with their friends, have a cooperative experience. Uh, so that was really the idea behind the friends module. So the way it worked was that you could add friends in game, and that would change the way you interact with that player. 
Uh, it's really, I think, where our server became very complex and the word uh, integrating uh, came up a lot. Uh, what I mean by that is that it wasn't enough to just simply design a hit detection system. Uh, it had to make sure that friends couldn't damage each other or each other's builds. The further we got in the fallen civilization, the more different modules and their respective data and code started to interact and depend on each other, uh, which made us have to really look hard at how we organized everything. Uh, so the friends module, that also marks my first experience with uh, SQL or SQL. Uh, so it's a language that works with databases. Uh, so SQL and the idea behind it, you know, databases, was uh, really important for what we were doing. Our vision from the start was that when people joined our server, they built upon the last time they joined. And each time they achieved more and more, and progress was saved from by us. The stamina system was a complete failure. My plan for the stamina system when I was beginning was to have some fun limitations on movement so that people didn't do crazy things, and it could also help with the immersion so it feels, you know, more lifelike. However, it ended up simply limiting everything that players wanted to do and was an annoyance. I integrated it with the IP menu so you could raise all the different stamina related skills, but that did not turn out as expected either. So the second craziest script of the server behind loot was Cursed. I started work on Cursed right after I finished the IP menu because I thought that it would be cool to have risk class reward zones. Enter if you dare, you might get some awesome loot, or you might die quickly and lose it all, or even lose more than you came in with. The concept itself was good, but my initial version of Cursed was less than ideal. Cursed would later be reworked two times, or maybe more, it's been reworked a lot. The first version featured flaming cars falling from the sky, spooky lights, and a lot of darkness. The cars would fall on people and crush them and explode and kill them, and it was pretty crazy. This version created some very strange issues in the game, such as anti-gravity, because the amount of collisions would overload the physics engine. Cars just be like floating around everywhere, and like even the destructibles in the game, like uh, you know the trees, um, and, like in the cities that have all those uh, different food items, they just float away. It was really crazy to see. So this prompted me to make a new version, this time centered around traps that players could step on and be affected by. Some of these traps exploded, teleported you, made you blind, slowly killed you, stuck you in place for a few seconds, and even made demon cars fly at you from all different angles. The main problem with this version was that I did distance checks for the traps on the server. So what this means is that for each player in a cursed area, for each trap in every cursed area, I would check the distance every tick. There were around 10,000 traps, so if there are 10 people in a cursed area, there would be 100,000 distance calculations per tick. And that's only every tick, just imagine every second. Every second there would be about 60 ticks, so you can see how it would get very expensive on the server and slow everything down. So another rework was in place. And uh, that's, that's where I took over the cursed module. I called it a uh, cursed V4 or version 4. And I tried to keep it really simple. So instead of cars and traps, I just stuck to meteors. I borrowed a lot of the cool effects and other signature atmospheric things that Farquaad had in the earlier versions. I remember one of the issues I had was that the meteors had totally random directions, or that's how I made them at first, and they would just never hit anybody on accident, so it was really ineffective. And just spawning a lot more of them, which seemed like a good idea, uh, led to crashes, just because the clients can't handle that many effects, and. Uh, uh, yeah, just because the clients can't handle that many effects. So I made it so one in every three meteors that spawned in the air was targeted at a person. So that made it a lot harder for people and they really hated that. Sometimes the meteors themselves would go through if the ray casts didn't have the surface or the surface was bugged and the meteors couldn't be hit by ray casts, which is what uh, the script was using. So when we started development on Fallen Civilization Survival District, the other survival server that was already alive and it was pretty popular at the time, so we wanted to set ourselves apart from it. One way we did this was through crafting. The overall design was not actually based on anything. The goals that I had for crafting was that I wanted it to be simple enough to where anyone could use it without difficulty, but also complex in that you would have to hunt down all sorts of different materials that you would need to craft stuff. This was heavily integrated with the inventory and the raw item category. The raw items could be crafted together to create powerful new items such as guns and build objects. I actually think that the crafting menu is one of the best looking menus on the server, however, I think the crafting system was a little too complex because of the huge variety and different items that certain items required to craft. It was extremely tedious to hunt down all the materials that you needed for a simple item. 
All right, so one big mistake that I think we're crafting is that we didn't secure it too much. Uh, the inventory system, uh, that was locked down pretty tight with encryption so that people couldn't make memory edits or anything and change the copies of their inventories on their client. Um, that was actually really important. A lot of people don't know that because otherwise um, we just have huge issues with hackers disrupting our in-game economy. Um, but as I said, we never got around to implementing that for crafting. So um, anyone who could guess who our script worked and like had you know enough skill to be able to pull something like that off, um, they could compromise the crafting scripts. So Farquad, he actually tested that himself, and he was just able to craft any item he wanted by making a simple edit. I'm pretty sure no one ever figured that out though. The last thing that I worked on right before the beta testing period started was the vehicle script. We definitely wanted some way to manage your vehicles where people could buy vehicles and then own them, waypoint them, and all of that. However, I wanted to make it so you could drive vehicles without actually purchasing them because I thought that it would be a little more interesting. It turns out while people liked it, it wasn't the best system to use and it created a lot of problems. Another interesting problem with vehicles was that the helicopters would often spawn underneath the helipads that they were supposed to spawn on top of and this created a lot of frustration for both the players and us. There were also some weird underlying issues that popped up, such as the other players' vehicles appearing in someone else's own vehicles list, and also vehicles not spawning correctly for players who own them. In the beta, you had to buy the vehicle first before using it, but we changed that quickly during the beta. We actually did start implementing item storage in vehicles, but it was never finished. So on to the building script. I created most of the building module while on vacation in December after the beta testing period. Dev34 was also on vacation at this time, and progress was slow for both of us, which caused the initial release to be delayed. Originally, I planned for the building system to be a land claim system where you had to find a land claim item in loot and then use it to claim an area, and then you could build in that area. This was actually coming along fairly well, but there were some issues that I was having difficulty with. I talked to Dev and we decided to try out a free build system where players could build anywhere they wanted, excluding a few areas such as safe zones and cursed areas. Three days after the initial release, I reworked the build script so that players could build anywhere, thus making the free build a reality in the server. This actually worked pretty well. The roads weren't blocked too much and players really enjoyed it. However, it did create some problems because people built structures to get into other people's bases, so we started to log and moderate more heavily. The doors that we had also had different access types that you could set so you could let just your friends in or just yourself or everyone and people really like that about Fallen Civilization.
So moving on to factions, uh, I spent a lot of time working on the faction system for the server. I started with a faction system that was available on the forum called AWG, and then I made huge expansions to it. So uh, once a player had 10,000 credits, they could create a faction. And the faction module uh, had a friendly menu where players could manage their factions, uh, do all kinds of things like kick, ban, uh, promote, and also see things like the member list. Uh, there are three tiers of membership, with the first tier being the owner. And people could also claim land with their faction, uh, with their land growing according to the rank of their faction. So rank went from one to five, and players could go to a higher rank by spending credits. The idea behind having land was that players would be able to build things on their faction turf, like houses, and also place faction guards, but both of these features never made to the public. Uh, factions were outlined on the terrain by smooth red uh, covering, which just rendered. And a uh, shout out to Jackson, one of the uh, Just Cause Single Player Mod devs, for uh, letting me use this code for that. So factions, overall, they weren't worked in very well with the rest of the server, and we had a lot of other big plans, uh, but nonetheless, we saw a lot of cooperative faction gameplay occurring. So some people built huge, awesome bases protected by mortars, and it was really fun to just travel around the server and see what people were up to and what they were building. All right, so one of the things on our to-do list uh, was to have some sort of turret. Uh, we didn't want to settle for just a classic turret, so we started experimenting with projectiles that have a parabolic trajectory. Um, so we're talking about mortars. After brushing up on uh, basic kinematics with uh, Init, who was um, one of our admins, he was actually a huge help with the script, um, and with his help, uh, we coded a simple mortar. Uh, from there, um, it was all just adding aesthetics, so we added all kinds of audio uh, and visual effects to really sell it. They ended up being a lot more influential than we originally intended them to be. Um, pretty much everyone was dying to get their hands on them, and people were just putting them everywhere. And a, lot, a lot of people were complaining about it. Um, so what we did was we increased the uh, crafting cost, and we actually did that several times because there were just so many. We wanted to really put a cap on that and, uh, you know, provide balance. The pet script was probably my favorite script we had on the server. None of the players knew about pets until I started going around with my pet, and people became very curious. Some people also asked about the companion key and what it was used for. The companion key was a crafted item that would give you super vague messages when you clicked it, such as the wind howls but you hear nothing, and the wind howls for you and you feel a presence near you. These messages change as the player got closer and closer to the place where you actually do get the pet. Once you're in range and click the item, the top of the missile silo would open up so you could jump in and discover your pet. I remember people searching for days and getting frustrated and it was amazing to watch. After one player found it, however, the secret became known and many people obtained pets. Pets always had more to fix though. Nearly every day I fixed some sort of pet bug. A lot of people really enjoyed pets, but I always felt like I could add more, and I certainly did have a lot of ideas. One of the secrets that people didn't know was their personality value. A player's personality value was calculated from many different things they do on the server, ranging from killing people to saying certain things in chat. If your personality value was negative, you were regarded as a more aggressive person, and you got a red pet that attacked people to match that. If your personality value was positive, you were regarded as a calmer person, and you got a blue pet that healed people to match. Your pet could actually change color throughout your time playing if your personality value changed. This did happen to some people. Pets also had their own experiences and levels and became stronger the more they were used. So after release, one of the things I really wanted to see in the server artificial intelligence. I knew that if it was done correctly, it could take the server to the next level. It was also a compensate for the lack of interaction with players, uh, and that was a complaint that we heard a few times. The first AI I ever worked on uh, were the squads, and you can see those in the release update video, so go check that out. So working on those taught me a lot of the basics of uh, using the API's client actor class, effectively syncing AI, and creating extensible hierarchies that manage AI. So all the squads really did was run together information on paths that I had laid out for them. Although I never really got to making them fully functional and able to fight players because I couldn't figure out a reliable way to do pathfinding, uh, they were a nice addition to the new biome. My next attempt at AI were zombies. Some of the people who played uh, on FC might remember these. I also used paths that were custom made uh, for these. I think a shout out is in order for Epi's. Uh, he was one of the moderators. 
and he actually recorded all the zombie pads that we ended up using in the server. So the idea behind zombies was that they would travel in hordes, and uh, when they came close to people, they would all attack at once. Uh, again, I didn't use any pathfinding algorithm for this because I wasn't skilled enough at the time. Uh, so the zombies, uh, they would just run straight at you. A cool mechanic they had uh, was their ability to jump over obstacles. I also added in some obstacle evasion code, uh, which I tested by just uh, running cars in front of them. Uh, those two things really helped them get around. I was never really satisfied with them though, because the sync on them was pretty bad, and at first I just had one network object for the horde, so I wasn't even syncing, syncing individual zombies. I uh, made some improvements later on, and I'd say overall they were playable and fun, and we even made them drop loot when they died. And a uh, cool thing about uh, their loot is that there's actually a 1 in 10,000 chance of getting a, a portal gun. And I don't think anyone ever got one though. I actually made the mistake of setting up my base uh, right on the path of the zombie horde. So I'd just be at my base and then all the doors would be locked. Uh, and then when I'd leave and open the doors, uh, all the zombies would just storm in and kill me because they'd get stuck running into the doors trying to get me. I swear it got me like every time. <laughs> After we took Fallen Civilization down, I continued working on projects in Just Cause 2 multiplayer mod, and eventually I ended up with a really cool zombie script using Sinister Rectus's padding engine. So uh, at this point I had like an actual padding algorithm, and it just looked a lot better. That was a lot of fun, and I learned a lot from using his pad engine too, because he was actually offloading the work to another server, and then having the Just Cause 2 server and uh, his server that he made um, communicate. We didn't have any wearable items in the beta, so this was one of the things I worked on between the beta period and the initial release. Customization was a big priority because I wanted people to be able to express themselves rather than just change their model. With the new social features, people could now wear hats, glasses, and disguises. Disguises were pretty cool because people could hide in plain sight as palm trees and bushes, and players really enjoyed those. Most of the items in your inventory were usable, and some of them were really interesting, so that's what we're going to talk about now. There are a few different types of drugs that you could find in loot, and they were all very rare. There were five documented types of drugs, and one more that was unfinished. The five documented drugs were the Loot Finder, Vehicle Finder, Player Finder, Mine Finder, and the Nitros, or the NOS. Each of these drugs worked nicely, but they didn't have any drawbacks. I did do a lot of experimentation with drawbacks from using drugs too much, but I didn't really like any of the things that I made, so drugs ended up having no drawbacks from usage. One drug that was planned was the mind game drug. This drug would do some weird things to your player, but it might also reset your personality value so that you could change the color of your pet. One highly requested thing were interiors. Uh, so for a while before the beta period, we experimented with having interiors. We built a test case at the hatch area on Lost Island, developed some tools to place items, and then found people who'd be builders. It never really took off because it was a lot of work to build an interior from scratch, and our builders weren't really up to that challenge, so we ditched the idea pretty quickly. I started working on the portal gun weapon during the public beta test, and it was added in the final release. Portal guns were a pretty neat addition to the server, and a lot of players liked them. They were originally given out for events only, but you could also obtain one by killing a zombie, as mentioned before. Another fun item was the Super Grapple. The Super Grapple was something that I had developed early on, and it fit nicely into our hierarchy of loot items, so it had an effective range of a thousand meters, and actually worked in a really hacky way. An invisible object would spawn in front of the player, and when they shot their grapple, the grapple would hit the object, the object would move away, and the player would be dragged along. Wings of Legend was the first and last quest line I worked on for Fallen Civilization. Once you were level 25, strange flames would begin to pop up around you every so often. And if you went in the direction of the flames, you would eventually find a gong. Once you found seven gongs, you would be given the Wings of Legend, which functioned nearly the same as the Wingsuit script, except you had these nice 3D wings that spread out your back and looked really awesome. If we make another survival server, I will definitely be working on more quest lines and probably some more. There were way too many types of food that you could find, and all the craftable types of food were pretty much worthless because it took forever to find all the components. I remember scrap metal was so useless that one guy was like, hey, can I eat scrap metal? <laughs> I just laughed and I was like, yeah, me too. Some of you guys might remember mines. Uh, we added mines to the release update. They were pretty simple. Um, the person who wasn't your friend would walk over a mine and it would start beeping and then explode. We wanted people to be able to protect their turf and set up traps for other players. 
Mines kept you on edge uh, while you were looting because you never knew if a mine was cleverly placed in your loot box unless you had a mine finder drug. Rope was one of the first experimental items added to Fallen Civilization. I was experimenting with placing players in the ragdoll state for indefinite periods of time. And I also figured out how to manipulate the player's velocity while in that form so they could be thrown around as a ragdoll. Because there's actually a bug where you can't set their uh, velocity through normal means while they're ragdolling. This was around the time that Reign of Kings was popular, so I'd watched some videos on that where people had a rope item where you could make someone ragdoll behind you, and I thought that it would be a fun item to add, so I created it. It worked fairly well, though it did have a few bugs. Rope was added to the server in January, and only a few players were able to see it in action because it was never in the loop. Hellfire missiles were inspired by piloted missiles of the same name. Uh, you can easily control one by just moving the mouse. Um, they had limited fuel, and it becomes harder and harder to turn as the fuel runs out. When the fuel runs out, or the missile hits the surface, it explodes. Their speed can also be increased. One thing we learned from the beta period was that the missiles were really overpowered. We figured this out when people started reporting that their bases had been totally annihilated by splash damage from Hellfire missiles. Uh, so in response, we nerfed them a little. People kept saying they were too much against builds, so we nerfed them again. During the beta period, I also added an auto-lock feature, where you could fly the missile at a person or a vehicle, press X to lock on, and from there you could pretty much take your hands off the mouse and watch it fly against the target. I was working on a hoverboard for a little while during January, however it had some bugs and never made it to the server. The goal for the hoverboard was to be a fun method of transportation. So now I'll talk about some of the other members of our team. Once development really got going and we had a good idea of what the server was going to look like, we started looking for people to help us in the alpha stage of the server. The main function of these people was to place the loot, because we wanted all the loot to be hand placed and we wanted all over the server and all over the map. So they also helped us refine uh, the earliest versions of our systems and make some design decisions. I think a huge shout out has to be given to Stuff Junkie, our first alpha team member, because he placed a majority of the loot on the server and that equates to about like over 10,000 loot boxes. Uh, he was a really active moderator too, and helped communicate the player's feedback to us, which uh, was really appreciated. We also had help uh, with loot placing from a few other guys as well. Uh, before the beta period, we also added Init to our team. Um, he's the guy behind the achievement system, and also helped us to protect our client-side data by showing us we could easily encrypt and decrypt Lewis state variables using the Zor cipher. During the beta period, we added Mr. FF1 to our team, uh, before he started working with us, our user interfaces were pretty bad overall, and there wasn't any unifying theme. He changed all that and created a really awesome and appropriate look for our survival server. So we first launched the server in a beta mode, and that was called the beta period. And the beta period, that was pretty rough. It was the first time that we opened up a working version of the server to the public, and but right away, uh, we had a lot of feedback, which really helped us to get ready for a proper release. The beta period made us realize that we had a lot of bugs though. I remember that the stamina and inventory scripts were really dragging down the server, um, but people picked up on that really fast and notified us. All of the icons for the inventory caused a lot of frame lag for many users. We reworked that interface, as I said uh, earlier. There were also uh, smaller aesthetic issues with the user interfaces. Uh, for bearing with us through this tough period, we gave everyone who joined the server during the beta period a cool blue beta name tag. One of the things that I noticed was that many people joined and had no idea what to do during the beta period. There wasn't a clear goal, and nothing was explained. I actually made a tutorial script a little bit into the beta testing period, I think, but it was not effective at all. It was basically a PowerPoint with 30 different slides and images on how to do stuff, and I know that most people just skipped right through it, because I would have done the same. So after the beta testing period, I started to work on a more interactive way to teach people the basics. Newbie Island. Newbie Island was meant to be a way for people who just joined the server to get a hang of things before going out into the real survival world. Noob Island was, again, a failure because it threw way too much at players at once. Players didn't care to read the messages that ran around Newbie Island and just wanted to get to the mainland, even though loot respawned much faster in Newbie Island. If we end up making another survival server, expect the new player experience to be very simple. There will probably be a place for more complex information that players can access if they are curious. Our initial release date was planned for January 1st, 2016, but we didn't have everything ready at that time. Dev wanted to get the durability system for the inventory done before the release, so he worked like crazy for a week trying to get it all done together. After the initial release, Dev disappeared for about a week in deep slumber. 
Unfortunately, we still didn't have time to implement the durability system. And as seen in the change log, we fixed tons of bugs nearly every day during the release period and made some drastic changes early on uh, after the release. The underwater update was the last update that came to Fallen Civilization. We had a lot of really cool ideas for the underwater update, but I think that our execution of them wasn't very good. For one, the air bubbles underwater showed up for people using Legacy Renderer, and that caused a lot of issues. People would look at the ground, and they would see these little white things, and they wouldn't know what they were. There also wasn't any loot in the underwater ruins, so there wasn't really a point to exploring them. We did plan to have rare loot in the ruins, but we never got around to doing it. We were also planning some sort of Atlantis questline where players would find some underwater portal to the city of Atlantis where there would be tons of good loot, but also dangerous enemies, such as sharks, and whales, and maybe even people. We also had plans to expand underwater building as seen by the air generator build item so that people could have bases underwater inside of air bubbles. This was the last big update before the server was shut down and we realized that we couldn't keep going on like this because the code base was so bad for some of our key scripts like loot. There were also frame drop issues associated with some of the underwater modules. For the underwater update, I made a submarine script which was a custom vehicle script where players could drive small submarines armed with cannons on the sides and one front cannon. Uh, today, I think this is one of my favorite scripts that I made, and it was pretty polished and incredibly fun to play. At one point before the underwater update was deployed, the server-wide submarine game mode took place for a few hours, and it was so much fun. And we actually have a YouTube video of that, go check that out. Uh, the side cannons and front cannon had respectively low times, the submarine can move in all directions with realistic acceleration and deceleration, as well as collide with objects in the world. I can never really figure out how to best incorporate submarines in the server, so I never really made it to the version of the underwater update that we had on the server. So now I'll talk about our reasons for shutting down the server. We already got into this a little bit earlier, but the main reason for shutting down is that the code base was just really bad. Uh, when we started, it was just Farquad and I, and we were both bad at programming at the time. Uh, as a result, we uh, developed the framework of the server in a way that was sloppy and most importantly inextensible. We realized this early on but kept pushing through. However, once we got to the underwater update, it had just become too much to handle. Introducing new content was nearly impossible because we were building off of something with an unstable foundation. It was really discouraging for us and we just didn't have the time or motivation to go back and refactor all our old code, which at this point was over 37,000 lines of code. I'm really proud of everyone on the team though. I think what we did is pretty amazing. We brought together people with a range of talents and worked towards realizing a shared vision for a survival server. In the end, we ended up releasing all the code because my aim from the very beginning was very simple. I wanted to make something cool and fun and share it with as many people as I could. So now forward to after we had shut down the server. So when we released all the code, we really didn't think anyone would go or had to take the time to go through all our stuff and do anything with it. But that actually wasn't the case. We saw a lot of clones of Fallen Civilization pop up. Even one where the developer had gone through and translated most of the server into Russian. We were really happy to see that. And now, it's time for a big announcement. Dev, drop that beat. Yes, we're working on another survival server, Survival Island. This time is just because 3 multiplayer. We have even bigger plans this time around and are ready for the start of another great adventure. We have links in the description to join our Discord server and the Steam groups so that you can stay up to date as the server develops. We want you to be part of the process. Just like before, we're looking for your input. Farquad put together an awesome server that you guys should definitely take, even if you haven't played in Fallen Civilization before. Just answer what questions you can. It would really help us make design decisions and make the server into something that everyone can enjoy. Thanks for watching the video, and we hope to see you on Survival Island soon. The next dev talk will be about Galaxar, a Just Cause 2 multiplayer server that Dev and I worked on for a bit after Fallen Civilization shut down.